Neurons are nerve cells that transfer information within the body. Most of the neurons' organelles are in the cell body. Most neurons have dendrites, highly branched extensions that receive signals from other neurons. The axon helix connects the cell body to the axon, which is typically a much longer extension that transmits signals from the axon helix to the axon terminal. Axons are insulated by a myelin sheath which causes an action potential speed to increase. Action potentials are the signals conducted by axons. Before talking about action potential, I'll first discuss basic concepts of resting potential and ion channels. Every cell has a voltage or difference in electrical charge across its plasma membrane called a membrane potential. Messages are transmitted as changes in membrane potential. The resting potential is the membrane potential of a neuron not sending signals, which is typically negative 60 to negative 80 millivolts. If the membrane potential becomes more positive, then it is said to be depolarized. If it becomes more negative, then it is said to be hyperpolarized. The resting potential is determined by the uneven distribution of ions across the cell. The equilibrium potential of an ion is the membrane potential that exactly balances the concentration gradient for an ion. The resting potential is maintained by ion pumps and ion channels, which causes uneven distribution of major ions. At resting potential, the concentration of potassium ion is greater inside the cell. To balance out the concentration gradient, potassium ion would spontaneously flow outside the cell, leading to hyperpolarization. Therefore, the equilibrium potential for potassium ion is more negative than the resting potential. On the other hand, the concentration of sodium ion is greater outside the cell. It will spontaneously flow into the cell, leading to depolarization. Therefore, its equilibrium potential is more positive than the resting potential. Another important ion that maintains the resting potential is chloride ion, which has higher concentration outside the cell. Ion channels allow a specific ion to cross the membrane. The electrochemical gradient drives the diffusion of ions across a membrane. It involves two components, a chemical force, which is the ion's concentration gradient, and the electrical force, which is the effect of the membrane potential on the ion's movement. There are four main types of ion channels. Non-gated ion channels are always open. Voltage-gated ion channels are activated by changes in membrane potential near the channel. Due to the electrochemical gradient, the opening of voltage-gated potassium channels will lead to hyperpolarization, whereas the opening of voltage-gated sodium channel will lead to depolarization. Ligand-gated ion channels or ionotropic receptors are activated by the binding of a ligand, which is a chemical messenger such as a neurotransmitter. On the other hand, metabotropic receptors are also activated by the binding of ligands. However, it is not an ion channel, but the receptor of a signal transduction pathway, which acts slower but is more amplified than ionotropic receptors. Lastly, mechanically gated ion channels are activated by mechanical stretch. Examples include the bending of hair cells in response to sound waves, as well as the activation of sensory neurons in response to touch. An action potential can be broken down into a series of stages. At the resting potential, some non-gated potassium channels are open. Potassium ions flow outside the cell, causing the resting potential to be polarized and closer to the equilibrium potential potassium ions. But most voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels are closed. During the second stage, a stimulus opens some sodium channels. Sodium ions flow into the cell, depolarizing the membrane. Action potential only occurs when the membrane voltage crosses a particular threshold. Therefore, an action potential is a brief O or non-depolarization. When the membrane potential reaches a threshold of about negative 55 millivolts, many voltage-gated sodium channels open. In the third phase known as the rising phase, a positive feedback cycle rapidly brings the membrane potential close to the equilibrium potential of sodium ions. Two events occur at the peak of the action potential. Most voltage-gated sodium channels become inactivated, blocking the inflow of sodium ions. Secondly, most voltage-gated potassium channels open, allowing potassium ions to flow out of the cell, which rapidly polarizes the cell during the falling phase. 
Both events quickly bring the membrane potential back towards the equilibrium potential of potassium ion. In the final phase, called the undershoot, the membrane's permeability to potassium ion is higher than at rest. So the membrane potential is closer to the equilibrium potential of potassium ion than it is at resting potential. The voltage-gated potassium channels eventually close, and the sodium-potassium pump restores the membrane potential to the original resting potential. During the refractory period after an action potential, a second action potential cannot be initiated. This ensures that an impulse moves along the axon in one direction only. There are two types of refractory period. The absolute refractory period corresponds to depolarization and repolarization. It is the interval of time during which a second action potential cannot be initiated no matter how large a stimulus is repeatedly applied, whereas the relative refractory period corresponds to hyperpolarization. And it is the interval of time in which a second action potential can be initiated, but the initiation will require a greater stimulus than before. Refractory periods are caused by the inactivation gate of sodium channels. Once inactivated, the sodium channels cannot respond to another stimulus until the gates are reset. An action potential can travel long distances by regenerating itself along an axon. At the site where action potential is generated, usually the axon hillock, an electrical current depolarizes the neighboring region of the axon membrane. Inactivated sodium channels behind the zone of depolarization prevent the action potential from traveling backwards. Therefore, action potential travel in one direction towards the synaptic terminal. For myelinated neurons, Action potentials are formed only at nodes of Ranvier, which are gaps in the myelin sheath where voltage-gated sodium channels are found. Action potentials in myelinated axons jump between nodes of Ranvier in a process called saltatory conduction. The speed of an action potential correlates with the degree of insulation by myelin sheath as well as with the increase of an axon's diameter. Neurons communicate with other cells at synapses, which takes place in five steps. First, an action potential arrives, depolarizing the presynaptic membrane. Second, the depolarization opens voltage-gated channels, triggering an influx of calcium ions. Third, the elevated calcium ion concentration causes synaptic vessels to fuse with presynaptic membrane, releasing neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Finally, neurotransmitter binds to ligand-gated ion channels in the postsynaptic membrane, which can allow specific ions to diffuse across. After release, neurotransmitter may undergo enzymatic breakdown, they may diffuse out of synapse or be reabsorbed by the presynaptic neuron. Neurotransmitter binding causes ligand-gated ion channels to open, generating a postsynaptic potential. Postsynaptic potentials fall into two categories. Excitatory postsynaptic potentials, or EPSPs, are depolarizations that bring the membrane potential towards the threshold, usually by the activation of ligand-gated sodium channels. The major excitatory neurotransmitter in our body is glutamate. On the other hand, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, or IPSPs, are hyperpolarizations that move the membrane potential farther from the threshold. They usually involve the opening of ligand-gated potassium and chloride channels. The major inhibitory neurotransmitter in our body is GABA. Unlike action potentials, postsynaptic potentials are graded and do not regenerate. A single EPSP is usually too small to trigger an action potential in a postsynaptic neuron. Temporal summation occurs when two EPSPs are produced in rapid succession by a single neuron or a spatial summation occurs when EPSPs are produced nearly simultaneously by different synapses on the same postsynaptic neuron. The combination of EPSPs through spatial and temporal summation can trigger an action potential. Through summation, an IPSP can counter the effect of an EPSP. The summed effect of EPSPs and IPSPs determines whether an axon helix will reach threshold and generate an action potential.